direct action. It involves the vast majority of people, and that's how we stopped it. Walk from Stone, Tower, Hamlets, Brighton, everywhere else. We've had young, old, black, white, Asian, straight and gay, women and men. That's the strength of our movement. Don't be complacent. This is no longer just a matter for Wolf and Forest. We all have to be, both on the TUC demonstration against austerity on the 20th, and we have to be in Wolf and Stone on the 27th, because I believe if we stop them again, we'll break the back of the EDL for once and good. And that's the prize for us. What a beautiful day it was for all of us in Wolf and Forest. I'd say 4,000 nil, to be precise. They didn't march. And they didn't get to their rally point to uh, spew out their bile and all their nastiness. Um, it, was, it was because of numbers, that's pretty, much, that's pretty much a fact, and because everyone was there. And th the thing about it is the buzz from that day was incredible. We showed the EDL and their Nazi mates that they're not welcome in Walton Forest, and they'll never be welcome in Forest. I'm going to tell you who's sitting on the platform that I'm going to introduce. Joe Cardwell from We Are Walton Forest. <laughs> Sophie Bolt, in no particular order by the way. Sophie Bolt from We Are Wolf and Forest. <laughs> Ifran Akdan from uh, uh, Wolf and Forest Camps of the Mosques. <laughs> and our Jennifer Arnold from Neighbours Love Assembly member. <laughs> okay, Joe, over to you. This is the current copy of the Wolf and Forest Guardian. I don't know that people can see the headline on here where it says, uh, Racists aren't welcome here. <laughs> Uh, this is in light, of course, of the EDL announcement they're going to come back on the 27th of October. I'm going to come on to that in a little bit. But actually, if it wasn't for the 1st of September, the front page of this newspaper wouldn't be what it is now. So we've actually created a culture of anti-racism and actually reinforced that inside of Waltham Forest with what we did on that day. And it was such an incredible day. I mean, such a buzz to have been a part of it. It really was our community on the streets. I mean, we said we are Waltham Forest, and we were Waltham Forest on that day. There's no two ways about that. You know, people that you normally see in your streets, that you go to the shops with, that you see when you go to work, that you see coming out of prayers, that you see when you're just nipping down the road. But actually, these are all individual acts. On that day itself, to see people come together with one common purpose of stopping the EDL, and to be a part of that was just something that was just incredibly powerful and incredibly moving. And I don't think we should underestimate really the power and the importance of, uh, of September the 1st in terms of what it's meant for the EDL and what it's also meant for the anti-fascist movement in Britain as well. And of course Dundee on that day was also incredible as well. And I mean I'm not going to go any more into how brilliant the day was because I'm sure other speakers would want to, will want to cover that as well. Because the key thing really is about how we did it. And of course it's not just us, like I mentioned, there was Dundee that happened on the day as well, and before us there has been, you know, loads of demonstrations against the English Defence League, and so really we are part of all of those demonstrations and that movement that led us towards the 1st of September as well. And I suppose, you know, in terms of like, one thing which I just want to sort of mention as well is that it's also really good to be a platform where we have the majority of women on this platform. And the reason why it is for me is because I think the idea that fighting fascism is some macho type of act, I just think is wrong. And I think we proved that on the yeah. day, actually, yeah. there were women, elderly, pensioners, young people, families, people with their kids. It was a fantastic day that everybody could be a part of. And for me, that is the real heart of fighting back against fascism as well. And also, I think, you know, we just proved why it was so important for us to be out on the streets. You know, what we saw on the streets on the 1st of September was really worth defending. Multicultural society is, a fan is actually it's the best thing about our society, to my mind. And I think it's absolutely wrong that these politicians are, are attacking it. And, of course, the context in which they're attacking it is also incredibly important. Because the economic crisis, the drive for austerity, has been accompanied across Europe by the consistent playing of the race card by European politicians. Cameron, Sarkozy, Merkel, all of them have played the race card and have really been attacking and blaming Muslims for the problems in our society. And so therefore, you know, for us, Actually, stopping the fascists was massively important because the crisis has created really a fertile ground on which they can grow. I mean, people would have heard that in earlier sessions as well. And so first and foremost, we knew that actually we had to call them 
fascist and, and racist, and we knew that we had to build a broad campaign against them as well. And there were arguments within our movement. Should there be Labour MPs on the platform? Should Muslim groups be included on platforms? Should Labour councils be included on platforms? And I'm very proud to say that actually at the heart of our movement, we actually said anybody who wants to fight back against the EDL is welcome on our platforms. Yeah. We stood side by side with every Labour politician and councillor actually fighting back against the EDL. And that was a massively important part of our campaign as well. We rejected the idea that we should allow anything other than the question of the EDL to determine actually what we did on that day. And of course the debates around cuts and austerity are important. You know, the trade unions that were also at the heart of our movement, some of our trade union members are actually at the forefront of facing the cuts and the austerity that are coming at them on a daily basis. Inside so the local authorities, trade unionists held workplace meetings. At the hospital that tried to hold a workplace meeting, I don't know whether Sam can speak about what happened with that, but actually workplace meetings and trade unions were actually a real backbone of our movement, not just in a financial sense, because you know, they, they financially sponsored us a great deal, but actually in the ways in which they communicate with their members to get them out on the streets. And the tradition of the trade union movement in fighting back against fascism and racism was a really important part of our campaign as well. And I have to say as well that for me as an SWP member, Actually, you know, Trotsky's theory around the United Front was a really fundamental part of actually how we tried to face the question of how we built our campaign. We didn't actually want to see a repeat of actually what, you know, I mean, the lessons of history in the 1930s, the tragedy that you see of the two large working class left wing parties who don't unite in the face of the threat of fascism from Hitler. And actually, what do you see Hitler and the Nazis just driving straight through the middle of it? We didn't want to repeat any of those mistakes. We wanted to see a unity in action. And so, again, we just felt that we were important, really, not just to come together in that way, not just to stand together, but also to march together. We knew we always wanted to stop the EDL, and we knew we wanted to stop them on the streets. And of course, you never know until the day, do you? Can you do it or can't you? You never know what numbers you're going to get. But on that day, as more and more people started turning up, as more and more numbers came, the confidence of people really grew. And actually, we knew then that we would be marching and that we would be out on the streets against them. And again, you know, to see, I mean, I have to say, the blockade on the corner, the junction, the bell corner with the forest road and Ho Street, to see that blockade was just brilliant. Because actually you saw Muslim elders, pensioners, kids, students, black, white, Asian, everybody was just part of that sit down and blockading and actually saying, they shall not pass, we will not let them come down, march down our streets. And actually that was incredibly powerful because they weren't allowed to go where they wanted to go. And to me actually it shows you, I think, what a united community can do as well. And I think actually we delivered an incredibly serious blow to the EDL that day. They couldn't meet, make the streets theirs. Actually, they received abuse everywhere they went. I mean, you know, they got flower pots thrown at them out of flats when they were taken round the back streets of Waltham Forest as well. People were coming out with handmade placards written on bits of kitchen towel, you know, racist not welcome here. You know, everywhere they went, they received abuse. And actually, finally, even when they made it to their rally point, they had to abandon their rally because actually as well, we had people who'd come out from the blockade, had come round and actually stood opposite the EDL and just humiliated them until they were told to abandon their rally and, and, and go home. And actually it's meant as well there's been splits inside the English Defence League since as well. The East Anglia division leader has resigned. You know, they're all having a go at each other, having big sort of faction battles inside the EDL Woo! because we've humiliated them. And that's a massively important point. And I think the reason why it's such an important point is because clearly, again, today we've talked about the different strategies that fascism has. In some ways they want to be politically, you know, these sort of suited rather than booted, but they also have their street fighting units. And this is really what the EDL is clearly sort of modelling itself on as being the street fighters, the people that can terrorise Asian communities and so on as well. And actually that day they weren't able to do that. And even though I don't think you can say these people are as advanced and involved as previous fascist movements, it's quite clear when you look at the strategy of Squadrismo from Mussolini's fascists in the 19, uh, 1920s, the brown shirts of Hitler in the 1930s, this element of fascism is a really important part for them. And the fact that they could not march in our streets, the fact that they could not intimidate people, the fact that they had to turn around and go home, they were the ones that kettled until 10 o'clock at night. They were humiliated and defeated, and that was a massive victory for our side. The other thing I think is this. Now, what do we see? A really desperate movement who have now announced they're going to come back on the 27th of October, and why? 
because actually they now feel they have to try and avenge the defeat that they had. It's a really desperate gamble, really, for the EDL. They've tried to call it Unite the Right, where they've tried to put a message out they want. I mean, even on the front page of the Waltham Forest Garden, it says, it, Tommy Robbins says, let's bu let bygones be bygones. You're all welcome to come back. They want to see the, the Northern Infidels, all these different splits and so on that they've, that they've had over the last couple of years. Actually, they're trying to pull them back together now. And it's a massively desperate gamble for them. And the truth is, is that either they are going to get massive police protection and be able to march through our streets because they're protected by the police, or they'll be seeking a ban in which case they can look like martyrs and try and play the freedom of speech card as well. These are the two options, really, I think that the EDL want to see. Either way... For me, I just think really in Walthamstow, our job for the next six weeks is just to make sure that this is not the making of the EDL, but the absolute breaking of yeah. the EDL. Yeah. And so for everybody, yeah. everybody, every anti-fascist around the country, every anti-fascist in London, actually we want to see you in Walthamstow on the 27th of October. And this time around, we really want to finish them off. I hope to see you all there. I was really, really proud of what we achieved. <laughs> But I also wanted to put um, our, our event in, um, in a bit of context because, you know, in large part, um, it's due to the amazing work of the United Against Fascism campaign fighting day in, day out, all around the country, that we're even in a situation where we're talking about, you know, the possible sort of uh, defeat of, of the EDL. And also for me, it was hugely beneficial, and also definitely to the campaign, that we were able to draw on the incredible knowledge and experience of the UAF um, secretaries, uh, Sabi and Wayman. Sabi, of course, went on holiday, which was absolutely terrible, but Wayman, you know, was, was uh, that, you know, absolutely vital in terms of the campaign. But also Azad Ali, who is um, another national officer of Unite Against Fascism, he was a really crucial link because he'd been totally centrally involved in the Tower Hamlets um, demonstration and that's something else that I wanted to come on to because basically it was that incredible demonstration in Tower Hamlets last year that started the EDL's decline. It was from then that we saw it. It was just much harder for the EDL to mobilise the numbers that they had. And so that campaign paved the way for Walthamstow and from the beginning we were always talking about how can we replicate this model that they had in Tower Hamlets. And we knew that the size of the mobilisation was going to be absolutely critical, that numbers on the streets was what was going to determine the success of the day and, crucially, how we would be treated by the police. We knew we had to massively outnumber the EDL. So the protest had to be a political response to fascism that reflected the breadth and the opposition that exists in society. Completely like Joe was saying, it has to involve absolutely everybody. And a key alliance within that, of course, was the Muslim community. But we also knitted in other political forces. In particular, we built very, you know, a strong alliance with the local MP, Stella Creasy. We worked closely with local disability rights organisations, as well as drawing on very large chunks of the arts community um, in North of Stowe, which is very large. Um, we also engaged lesbian and gay activists and linked up with sections of Christian, Jewish and Sikh communities. And all of this was absolutely vital in terms of the mobilisation. But the central involvement of the Muslim community was absolutely decisive. Yeah. We knew that without the engagement of the Muslim community, the campaign would not reflect the breadth of opposition to the EDL. Because it is the Muslim community that is most at risk at the moment from fascism. It is the EDL's main target. And in Walsham's, though, we have the third largest Muslim population in London. So linking up with the Council of Mosques was crucial. And for me, it's been a really, really great experience and a real privilege to be able to work closely with Ifan and the Council of Mosques. And I believe that their leadership and their courage was absolutely decisive in our campaign. Yeah. They took a very clear and principled stance that if the EDL were not banned, they would mobilise the mosques to come out and protest. And once that mobilisation started, the whole dynamic of the campaign shifted. I remember I was putting up posters with um, Laura and Chaz the week before the demonstration, and we were saying we could just feel the difference on the streets. Um, everything just start, started to come together. All the, the hard work, the leafleting of, of the stations, of the streets, of, of everywhere, we really felt that it was just we just turned a corner. It was absolutely incredible. 
But this campaign was also about building long-term alliances with our community. A major factor for me and for everybody in the campaign was the standing of the Muslim community not only going into the protest, but also coming out of it too. We didn't want a demonstration that descended into violence or could be presented like that. We knew that this would have damaged the Muslim community and the brave leadership that had urged the mosques to join the demonstration in the first place. And despite overwhelming opposition to the EDL in Waltham Forest, there was considerable political hostility to having a protest against them. We know that prior to Tower Hamlet's demonstration, there was a big problem with the media, it's still going on, in that it presents anti-fascist mobilisations as having some kind of equivalence to fascism. EDL thugs versus anti-fascist thugs. Now obviously this is totally disgusting racism and wholly irresponsible, but what's new with the media? And this is what the, the local council were doing as well. Whilst they supported a ban of the EDL, it put out adverts urging people not to attend our demonstration. It argued that protesting against the EDL would increase the risk of violence. Totally and utterly disgusting. So a very big part of our campaign was around the right to protest, the necessity to protest. We argued through the local press, social media, which was a very big factor, and also through local council forums, that we, the anti-fascists, we represented the interests of the whole community. We were the ones taking responsibility for the situation. By organising a peaceful demonstration, we were the ones standing up and defending our community against the EDL. We were the ones providing leadership, most crucially, for our young people. And our protest was never about a physical confrontation with fascists, even though some sections tried to scaremonger it would have vastly reduced the mobilisation. We knew that we had to organise a peaceful event that would mobilise the full breadth of opposition to the EDL, as we say, so that everyone could be included in that, all ages, backgrounds, families and children. And something else that was a key lesson from Tower Hamlets was that we had to engage young people. We had to make sure that they weren't drawn into a violent confrontation, not only with the police, but with the EDL. And we know that that's one of the EDL's tactics. So we knew that we couldn't just hold a rally. We knew that we couldn't hold young people there for two hours. They were going to be sort of drawn up, not just young people, lots of people were just going to be drawn off towards the EDL. And so we planned in advance with the police um, a march. And we waited basically until the day to see if that, was, if that was the right thing to do. But we wanted a plan in advance to make sure that it was peaceful and as organised as possible. And the aim was to keep the movement together, to keep it united, to make sure that our young people were totally part of the mass of the demonstration. Because this was about trying to ensure our young people were not criminalised. And we know, we've seen that the history around this. It's our young Asian and Muslim communities that are the ones that are criminalised, the ones that end up with the custodial sentences. And we didn't want that. We don't want that. We don't want the future of our young people blighted by their very real and total understandable fury at the provocations of fascists, fascists on the streets. And despite some slightly hectic moments, I must be honest, on the day itself, I think we achieved a pretty incredible thing. A massive, united demonstration, which was overwhelmingly peaceful, that totally defeated the EDL. And I think this was decisively because of the numbers that we've been able to mobilise, precisely because of the alliances that we've been able to form. But I think it was also down to excellent stewarding. We really had some incredible stewards. But I think it was also because of the political maturity from our young Asian population. They had a total understanding of what the EDL wanted to provoke, a violent confrontation, and they weren't going to rise to the bait. But just very finally, um, obviously there has been a very negative impact of the fact that the EDL were able to march. The police tried to reassure our community um, and residents that the EDL would be peaceful. They circulated this uh, leaflet that said that they would not tolerate racist or offensive behaviour on the march, that inflammatory placards would be removed, that suggestions of shops being attacked were scaremongering. This was totally and utterly insulting the intelligence of our community, and we knew that. And so what did we see on that day when they were able to march? 
We saw shops being forced to close. So they were basically told that if they didn't close, they wouldn't get police protection. So our local community, our local economy, totally suffered just to force fascists through our community when they weren't welcome. Our Hindu temples had to close. Our young people, some of our young people, are facing criminal charges. And I think, worst of all, we have a situation where children and families are now deeply traumatised by EDL members screaming abuse at them, taking photographs of their homes and threatening need to come back. And that is the reality of a march by the EDL. So if you ask me, do I want them to come back? Do I want the EDL to come back on the 27th of October to my community? I will say to you, no. I want my community to be able to live in peace, to go about our lives, to live our, and celebrate our multicultural society as we do. It's a total abuse of our community, them coming back here. To have the threat of fascists trying to march for our community three times in, in as many months. This to me is a form of, it's basically a siege of our multicultural community. But if the police do again force this march through our community, if the remnants of fascism attempt to use Walthamstow to try and assert themselves in this disgusting manner, then of course we call on all of you to come out and support us. We need to make sure that we truly replicate the model of Tower Hamlets. We need a national mobilisation. We need coachloads of people coming from all around the country to defend the residents of, of Walthamstow so that we can stand shoulder to shoulder together and hopefully this time, who knows, we might actually really defeat them. Thank you. My name is Yafan Afta from the Council of Mosques. Um, I suppose my uh, information to you guys, uh, or to address you guys, will be mainly how Muslims got involved and maybe in historical context as well about why Muslims often don't get involved. And this is something that we, is a blueprint that we can use up and down the country. Because in particular, the, the idea of the elder generation that we have who are running the mosques in particular, they avoid confrontation. We used to do marches and we march every year to celebrate the Prophet's birthday. But that's a, obviously a celebration, it's a, a peaceful occasion, there's no uh, antagonism or no, no trouble you know, anticipated. But this time, usually, well, the idea for all the mosque people generally, the idea was to get it banned if we can, and the council was supporting that, so were the police. Uh, well, the police weren't, but the council and the MP were. And they said, if we have it banned, they don't come, fine. You know, we, we'd be happy with that. But they took the advice of the police that said, don't join any counter demonstration. And usually, certainly the elder generation, and there's a, there is a divide between the elders and the younger. When I say elders, I'm talking about those who emigrated to the country. They feel obliged, in, de in debt, gratitude towards the country, in a subconscious sense. So even though they feel part of the culture here, culture here they don't want to rock the boat. The younger generation, the guys who are born here, they're a bit more uh, confident in taking their rights, knowing what their rights are. And they will stand up. But often they're not the ones in control in the mosque. They're not the ones who have the chance to talk to the audience, to the masses. And even though the youngsters, a lot of the youngsters guys, they would actually go out. And they would face the EDO, with or without any demo or without any authorization. They're not scared of the police, they're not scared. And that element that we have to keep uh, in check, we have to keep in control. But around the country you'll find people, as soon as the police say, don't demo, don't march, the police, the most leaders will say, fine, we're not going to march. But can you ban it, please? It's that kind of uh, attitude. Police, but at the meeting we had at the council, and it was quite late, it was in August that we had this meeting, it was during the month of fasting, and the police ultimately said, their response was quite clear to me anyway, that they said, don't stand up. And they, when we asked about why they're not banning it, they said the threshold, and they didn't find it, they said the threshold has not been reached. And because this threshold is not reached, we're not going to ban it. And people cited Tower Hamlets, and they said that was a different scenario. I mean, the context behind Tower Hamlets was the riots that happened, police were stressed beyond imagination, so they couldn't handle another riot sparking off. In our area, they were thinking, we can handle whatever comes. So when I went back to the council with a meeting with the council of mosque, Every, most, almost every single member the, and the leaders of the mosque are saying, we don't want confrontation. And there is an uh, opinion or a school of thought, and these are people who are the faith forum, uh, one of the guys who's the chair of the faith forum, a uh, Christian guy, he also, there's a school of thought that thinks if you ignore them, they go away. But people who are experienced, like Wayman mentioned, in Birmingham initially, we tried to ignore them, but they grow in confidence. It was these kind of experiences that we had, I had to try and convince the guys, and I was on my own at the beginning, trying to convince them that we need to make a stand. And there's no doubt, in my mind, there's no doubt to the mosque members that they realised the EDO's plan initially was to walk from one end of the high road in Leyton, near the Olympic site, 
all the way to the high street in Walthamstow, through the heart of two towns, and past at least four mosques. That was their original plan. And their, their plan would not have changed until we threatened that we're going to join the counter demo. When we said, we, if this doesn't get stopped, we're going to join the counter demo, then the plan changed twice. First, they changed the march, because we went to Scotland Yard, and we said, when well, it's not acceptable, they go past any mosque. So the plan changed. Their route went from Baker's Arms, if you know all of them so at all, from Baker's Arms to, uh, to the high street. So they missed out all the mosques. And they said, now you should be happy with it. We said, we're not happy with that either. And then we suggested, we're going to walk down, we're going to march down Hoe Street, the main road, the high road. So then they changed their march and put them in a corner in Black Horse Road. But March pushed them in the corner, and even the barrel commander, he was surprised at how easily they accepted it. He was surprised the EDO accepted such a route that was not popular, it was in a corner. That was the main success. And if we didn't threaten to join the counter demo, to stand up against them, they would never approve that march. And that was the biggest success that we had. generally around the country, Muslims have to realize that it's fine to say we don't want to stand, we don't want confrontation, we don't want trouble, but unless we make a stand, things don't change. Yeah. And that's the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. When, when we saw that happen, that was one a win before we even actually reached the day, and it gave people confidence that actually the police are listening, or they're being forced to listen to what we have to say. We pushed for a ban to the end. And then we obviously we pushed for a because we wanted that to happen, police and councillors. We were irritated with the councillors, our elected representatives, that they were going for the ban, but when we said if a ban doesn't happen, you have to stand with us, they refused. And we're going to hold them to account for that. We're not letting them get away with it. They should have stood with us on that day. The MP did stand with us on that day. We managed to get the MP with us. She stood. But they, even her, she was saying, don't do a demonstration, don't actually march. And we said, well, if people are going to march, but the police said, if you march together, then you'll be safe. If people individually march, the youngsters go, they're going to be victimized. They're going to be, sorry, criminalized. They're going to be the ones that are going to get arrested. So we had to keep our people together. But I think the message again, one is convincing the guys, and it's not saying ignore the elders, but where you have younger guys who are born here, they'll be more inclined to make the changes, make that movement happen. And up and down the country, it was a, it's, a, it's a learning experience for me, and the contacts I've made here and the experiences I've learned, I can share with mosques up and down the country. Wherever the EDO go, we should be able to mobilize the mosque in those areas. Yeah. that as well as mobilizing the mosque in that area, the benefits are the key benefits is in this one, the concrete evidence is that if we didn't mobilize, they would have marched through the heart of the town. That's something to take away and to show people it can be done, we can actually have a positive impact. Pushing them out in the corner, if we push them out in the corner, marginalize them, that's what they're going to be upset about. They don't have the oxygen of publicity going through the, our, our, the heart of our community. And hopefully, if we stay together, and again, as Sophie mentioned, in particular, that we do want to keep this, um, this multiculturalism and this actually alliances that we've made during the demonstration you know, together and strengthen it throughout the year. And one of the things I offered, actually, when I, made, when I spoke and addressed the, the people that attended there, was that we have open days, we open the mosque up. We want people to come to the mosque to see what it's about. When you have experience of other faiths and other communities, then it cannot waver. You won't believe the propaganda of the media against us or yeah. against anyone else. So that really experience is something you can take forward, and then we will be truly multicultural and defend each other you know, in the future years to come. Thank you. pick up something that he said. You see, for me, the idea that anybody who holds elected office should want to be thinking that they don't have a duty, that they don't have a responsibility to march, to stand up and speak against the EDF is something that I just cannot understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I cannot understand that. Now, I say to myself, it's because of my background. I say it's because when I was growing up, my relatives were being kicked, attacked, stabbed and killed in Notting Hill. I say it's because when I was growing up, then um, smelling up the road, um, we had to um, get in our houses early, otherwise we would be kicked and beaten, and it didn't matter whether if you were a woman, a young girl or pregnant. 
I say it's because it's my youth when I was growing up and I knew that if I had to, if I wanted to speak out, I had to be part of the action as well because speaking is good but it is not enough. And so when I got involved with my union GMB and when I was fighting for justice against discrimination, against racism, I knew where that was coming from and that was coming from the experience of this country and many other countries of fascism. Because you know what, they will not go away. They just hide in dark places, <laughs> waiting to come forward. They are not going to, I know I love it Joe. we're going to give them a kick in if we have to. Yeah. 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 But I'm with you that way. But you know, I really believe that that's how they don't go away. Because it, it, it somehow, um, you know, um, uh, Ken was talking about genes, I, I talk about DNA and use it loosely in a sense. There are some people that for whatever reason they get it into their heads that it's okay to preach hatred. It's okay because they want to feel superior against other people for them to get involved in that particular um, activity and group. I want to be with the majority. I want to be with you. I am with the UAF all the time out there on the street. And I'm usually there when we need to stop them in terms of the election process. So there's two things I say. I say that we have a duty to come out and we have to get the message that this isn't just us in Waltham Forest. And I just was a bit concerned that I was seeing tweets saying all the action is going on in Waltham Forest, good luck. It's like it was our business and not theirs. You know, if you could tweet, you could come out and be... Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying to elected members, I was shocked and appalled that they were talking about, oh, we've had the discussions, oh, the police have said, you know, it's too dangerous, where there will be problems if there's a countermarch. Well, I mean, when are the streets dangerous when the EDL are on the streets? <laughs> I've got a new one now, and I said, um, have you read the EDL information? Have you heard them speak? Isn't that, if you like, the language of violence, the language of discrimination? Is what, you know, if that is okay, then I tell you, us coming out, saying we are Wolf and Forest, that has to be our right, and we have to be out there in front of the EDL, and that's where we were on that day. Yeah. We were in front of them. And that's why I thought I'd stop sitting down on the streets. I have to tell you, I'm getting a little too old and I'm glad I didn't have my granddaughter because, you know, uh, she wouldn't understand. But uh, she's only three. Um, so, but I thought to myself, you know what? Yes, we are at this point and it was absolutely inspired thinking that at that junction we would sit and we would take our stand at that junction. I will never forget that over a hundred thousand people came out for me during the GLA election. And I know that one of the strongest things that made them came out, it was the message that with UAF and other organizations we were saying, come out for people like myself, because if you don't, you'll get members of the British National Party. And that message is the one that we'll be taking to comrades to say, come to Waltham Forest um, on the uh, 27th of October. Uh, it's our streets, but it's your streets as well. Because you cannot sit apart from us. We have got to be out there, we've got to have the numbers, and we've got to make sure that everybody knows that we're not going to be silent, we're not going to let the EDL, and anybody at who doesn't want to take part in that, we know where they are as well, and we will find the appropriate measures for dealing with them. Thank you very much. Uh, we should be complacent, uh, and I'll tell you why. Because the EDL going back is quite a clever manoeuvre by them, and I believe that they are gambling on one of two things happening. In fact, I think they're gambling on one thing happening. So they're gambling that the state is going to surround them, protect them, 
and allow them to come back for a second time. And that will not be easy for the anti-fascist movement. Let's not kid ourselves. Some people in this room are young enough to remember when they allowed Martin Webster, one man, to carry a flag and march down the street with 4,000 police officers protecting him so he could have his freedom of speech and deny everybody else theirs. So let's be clear, that's what they want to happen. And so we're going to have to be sharp. And I'll tell you what's happening. The same arguments that were in the build-up to Walthamstow are reappearing now. And I want to just take on two of them. You see, there's one which is really the argument which is we're going to get them, we're going to smash them up, we're going to have groups of us kicking their heads in. I don't, I don't believe that's the way you stop the fascists. I don't believe there's ever been a way of stopping the fascists by small gangs of people beating them up. I think two things will happen if you have that kind of strategy. One, actually it's a strategy which really ignores everybody else. It really says unless you're a big tough boy, you're not really welcome in our movement. It ignores the fact that they've from Stone, Tower Hamlet, Brighton, everywhere else we've had young, old, black, white, Asian, straight and gay, women and men. That's the strength of our movement. And if you just allow it to go into the kind of, you know, mirror their own sort of squad and stuff, it's wrong. And I tell you, I'm a big fan of Malcolm X. And once Malcolm made a really powerful attack on Martin Luther King, he said, any man can sit down, but it takes a man to stand. And that's what taking the piss out of Martin Luther King, saying that your sittings are worthless. But I'll tell you what we are awful stone showed, and actually the Tower of demonstration, and Brighton, actually, sometimes it takes a movement to sit down to make a stand. Because actually, non-violent mass direct action involves the vast majority of people, and that's how we stop to involving the vast majority of people. So yes, sometimes it can sound more militant to say we should smash them, but actually, it's just more militant to involve thousands of people saying they shall not pass. The last thing I want to say is this about banning. You see, I think there's a danger of us calling for a ban, because it's exactly what John McCartney was saying for Tower Rabbits earlier. You see, what we're going to do if they say they're banned from marching, they have the right then to hold a static protest. And if they get their right to hold a static, and this is what they've done every time they've been banned, they've never been stopped. They ban them from marching, but they allow them either to gather and then march up the street, or to stay in one place. Would it be a defeat for them if they're allowed to have their static protest outside the town hall on the, on the 27th? No. They'll be back where they want it to be in the first place. The danger of the ban is it gives the power to the state and the police to impose us. What we showed uh, a couple of Saturdays ago is we don't need them because we, united, have the power. And therefore, for me, the lesson for the 27th is don't be complacent. Everyone's got to go back to where they live, to their workplaces, to their faith groups and say, this is no longer just a matter for Wolfram Forest. This is a matter for every single one of us. And we all have to be both on the TUC demonstration against austerity on the 20th, and we have to be in Wolfenstein on the 27th, because I believe if we stop them again, we'll break the back of the EDL for once and good. And that's the prize for us. I think it's been an absolute brilliant panel, and it's really shown the sort of diversity and the breadth of actually what we managed to build inside of Wolfenstein as well. And I think there are people that should be held to account. I think the head of the council should be held to account for asking people to go to the film fest, the Forest Film Festival, rather than joining us on the demonstration on the day in Walthamstow on the 1st of September. I think the police should be held account, to, to account. Because actually, when we tried to organise a workplace meeting at Whips Cross Hospital, where we had all of the staff side trade unions back in that, where actually the management had given, had given permission for that, it was the police who went to the hospital and said, oh, we're not too sure about you letting Wayman Bennett to come on here to actually do this. He has friends with unsafe characters. I'll tell you what, I want to see the staff at Whips Cross Hospital hold another meeting before the 27th of October and let's see the police come back again after 4,000 of us are on the streets and say that actually we're yeah. the ones that are unsavoury characters. So yeah. we have to redouble our efforts with all of this stuff. In every workplace across that borough we need to be leafleting, we need to have meetings, we need to be mobilising. The thing that's on our side now as well is the colleges are back, the universities are back. So there again we need to be redoubling our efforts and getting the message out to people that once again again, we are going to have to be back on the streets to stop the EDL. Because while we have to politically expose the police and the council, we know for a fact that we cannot rely on these people to do the job for us of wiping the fascists off our streets. The only thing that undermines fascism, that undermines racism, is when we see a multicultural community 
on the streets, confident, and actually facing those people down. And again, this isn't about fighting in terms of fists. This is a proverbial fight where actually it's our presence, it's our strength of our community and our numbers that actually is what turns those people around and sends them back into the dark corners where they came from. And Jeanette's right. These people do crawl back into dark corners and sometimes they do try and come out again. So facing the issues around austerity and cuts is important for us as well in terms of actually how we challenge the grounds on which these people grow from. But the beauty of our campaign is that actually it has revitalised the labour movement in general across Waltham Forest. People actually want to stand up together and be counted. They feel proud of where they come from. They feel proud to stand up against the Nazis. And actually we need to have a day of pride again on the 27th of October. I don't care what they try and put in our way. We need to see mass numbers mobilised on the streets like the 1st of September and really try and finish them off the